Clayton Moore's daughters confirm the rumors about his private life. Clayton Moore was born Jack Carlton Moore on September 14, 1914, in Chicago, Illinois, and was the youngest of three sons of Teresa Violet and Charles Sprague Moore. His family's origins and lifestyle during his early years suggest a comfortable upbringing. According to the 1930 federal census, Moore's father, a native of New York, worked as a real estate broker in Chicago. This profession allowed the family to enjoy a relatively prosperous lifestyle. The Moores were affluent enough to employ a full-time maid, Amelia Hirsch, indicating their household was financially secure during the Great Depression, a time when many American families struggled to make ends meet. This stable economic environment likely afforded more opportunities that would shape his early development and later career. From a young age, Moore displayed a natural athleticism and a sense of daring that set him apart from his peers. By the age of eight, he had already embarked on a career as a circus acrobat, demonstrating not only physical prowess but also an early inclination for performance. His acrobatic talents were honed through years of practice, leading him to perform at prestigious events such as the Century of Progress Exposition in Chicago in 1934, where he was part of a trapeze act. This was an impressive achievement for a young man of his age, and it reflected his early passion for show business and performing in front of crowds. Moore's education also played a crucial role in shaping his character and discipline. He attended several notable institutions in Chicago, including Stephen K. Haight Elementary School, Sullivan Junior High School, and Sen High School on the city's far north side. These schools provided a strong educational foundation, while also fostering his interest in physical activity and performance. During these formative years, Moore balanced his academic responsibilities with his extracurricular interests, particularly in athletics and acrobatics, which would serve as stepping stones to his later success in the entertainment industry. In his early adult years, Moore found success as a model, working for the prestigious John Robert Powers Modeling Agency. Modeling at the time was a competitive and glamorous profession, and Moore's success in the field not only highlighted his good looks and charisma but also introduced him to a world of connections in fashion and entertainment. This experience provided him with the confidence and exposure that would later prove invaluable when he transitioned to Hollywood. In the late 1930s, Moore made the pivotal decision to move to Hollywood in pursuit of a career in acting. Upon his arrival, he worked as a stuntman and bit player using the athletic skills he had developed in his circus days to perform dangerous and physically demanding stunts. His background as a model also opened doors for small roles in films, bridging his transition from modeling to acting. Around 1940, Hollywood producer Edward Small suggested Moore adopt the stage name Clayton, which would later become iconic. This advice came at a time when Moore was starting to gain recognition in the film industry, albeit in supporting or smaller roles. His new stage name helped him build a distinct professional identity that separated him from his earlier modeling career. Moore's work in the early 1940s consisted mostly of small roles in B-Westerns, which were low-budget, often formulaic films that served as the training ground for many actors of that era. However, he quickly established a reputation as a reliable performer. He starred in four Republic Studio cliffhangers and two Columbia Pictures films during this period which, while not blockbuster hits, allowed him to build his resume and gain experience in front of the camera. Like many men of his generation, Moore's career was interrupted by World War II. He enlisted in the U.S. Army Air Forces, where he was assigned to the 1st Motion Picture Unit, a unique branch of the military dedicated to producing training and propaganda films for the war effort. This assignment allowed Moore to contribute to the war while continuing to hone his acting skills. He worked alongside fellow actors such as Arthur Kennedy, co-starring in training films like Target Invisible, which played an important role in educating military personnel. This experience reinforced Moore's connection to the film industry and kept him active in a time when many of his peers saw their careers put on hold. Moore's big break came in 1949 when he starred in The Ghost of Zorro serial, a project that caught the attention of George W. Trendle, co-creator and producer of the popular radio show The Lone Ranger. This series had captivated audiences with its story of a mysterious former Texas Ranger, the sole survivor of a massacre, who roamed the West with his faithful Native American companion, 
Tonto, righting wrongs and helping those in need. When Trendle decided to bring the series to television, Moore was cast as the title character. This marked a turning point in his career, as he became the face of one of the most iconic Western heroes in television history. With Rossini's March of the Swiss Soldiers from the William Tell Overture as the show's theme music, The Lone Ranger became an instant sensation, marking the first time a Western had been written specifically for television. The show's popularity grew rapidly, and it became the highest-rated program on the fledgling ABC network, propelling both Moore and his co-star Jay Silverheels, who played Tonto, into the limelight. The chemistry between Moore's Lone Ranger and Silverheel's Tonto became a defining feature of the show, contributing to its massive success. Their portrayal of the classic Western heroes left an indelible mark on American pop culture, and Moore became synonymous with the role of the Lone Ranger. In 1950, the show earned an Emmy Award nomination, solidifying its place in television history. Moore's portrayal of the masked hero resonated with audiences, and he became a beloved figure in households across the country. However, his journey with the Lone Ranger was not without its challenges. During the third season, Moore was controversially replaced by John Hart, reportedly due to a contract dispute. Despite this setback, Moore returned to the role in the fourth season, much to the delight of fans. Moore later revealed that the producers never explained why he was replaced or why he was ultimately brought back, leaving some mystery surrounding the behind-the-scenes dynamics of the show. Moore's final two seasons on The Lone Ranger saw the show transition to color for the first time in its fifth season, adding a new dimension to the series. In total, he appeared in 169 of the 221 episodes produced, firmly cementing his legacy as one of television's greatest Western stars. Even after the show ended, Moore continued to embrace the role of the Lone Ranger, often appearing in public in character, much to the delight of his fans. He became an enduring symbol of the American Western hero, a legacy that would follow him for the rest of his life. Clayton Moore, best known for his iconic portrayal of the Lone Ranger, made several notable appearances in other television series during his time on the Lone Ranger, a testament to his versatility as an actor. In 1952, he guest starred in an episode of Bill Williams' syndicated western The Adventures of Kid Carson, a popular show of the time that allowed Moore to showcase his cowboy persona in a different light. His guest spots in Jock Mahoney's action-packed series The Range Rider in both 1952 and 1953 further solidified his status as a western star. The Range Rider was known for its fast-paced storytelling and adventurous plots, making it a perfect vehicle for Moore's talents. These guest roles demonstrated that, while the Lone Ranger would come to define his career, Moore's acting range extended beyond the mask and the white horse he rode in on. During his tenure as the Lone Ranger, Moore's collaboration with Jay Silverheels, who played Tonto, became one of television's most famous partnerships. Silverheels, a First Nations actor, brought depth and authenticity to the role of Tonto, and the duo's chemistry was a significant factor in the show's success. The two actors shared not only a professional relationship but a personal bond as well, one that Moore often spoke about with deep respect. Silverheels, a proud Mohawk, was often a target of racial prejudice in Hollywood, yet Moore consistently praised his co-star's professionalism and skill, referring to him as a true friend. Their collaboration extended beyond the small screen, as Silverheels joined Moore in two feature-length Lone Ranger films. The Lone Ranger, 1956, and The Lone Ranger and the Lost City of Gold, 1958, allowed the pair to bring their beloved characters to the big screen, further cementing their status as cultural icons of American Western lore. After the completion of The Lone Ranger and the Lost City of Gold in 1958, Moore embarked on a remarkable 40-year journey of personal appearances, embodying the Lone Ranger character long after the show had ended. These appearances ranged from promotional events, such as the now-famous Lone Ranger-themed restaurants in Southern California, to television guest spots and classic commercials where he reprised his role as the Masked Man. Despite the passage of time, Moore's commitment to the character never wavered, and he became a beloved figure for generations of fans. Children who had grown up watching The Lone Ranger on television now brought their own children to meet him, creating a multi-generational legacy of adoration for Moore and his portrayal of the heroic figure. 
His efforts to keep the character alive extended to charitable events and civic engagements, where he would make appearances as the Lone Ranger to support causes he believed in. Silverheels, although more private, occasionally reunited with Moore during the early 1960s for special events and fan conventions, delighting audiences with their continued camaraderie. The sight of the Lone Ranger and Tonto together again evoked a powerful sense of nostalgia and admiration. Moore often used these moments to express his ongoing admiration for Silverheels, acknowledging his contributions to both the success of the show and the representation of Native American actors in Hollywood. For Moore, Silverheels wasn't just a co-star, he was an integral part of the legacy of the Lone Ranger and a symbol of friendship and respect. One of the most memorable stories involving Moore's dedication to the Lone Ranger persona came to light many years after the height of his fame, when actor Jay Thomas began recounting a hilarious and heartwarming tale about Moore during the Christmas season on The Late Show with David Letterman. This tradition, which started in 2000, became a beloved part of the holiday season for Letterman's viewers. In the story, Thomas, who was working as a radio disc jockey in North Carolina at the time, found himself in an extraordinary situation when he met Moore during a promotional event at a local car dealership. Moore was there in full Lone Ranger costume, captivating fans with his iconic presence. However, at the end of the event, Moore found himself stranded at the dealership without a ride. Thomas, recognizing the surreal nature of the situation, offered to drive him back to his hotel. What followed was a sequence of events that would become the stuff of legend. As Thomas drove Moore in his Volvo, a passing motorist collided with his car, damaging the headlight. Rather than letting the incident go, Thomas decided to chase the offending driver, eventually cornering him in a nearby parking lot. The situation grew tense as the driver taunted Thomas insisting that no one would believe his story about being in an accident while driving the Lone Ranger. At this critical moment, Moore, still in full costume, emerged from the back seat, mask and all, and delivered the unforgettable line, they'll believe me, citizen. The sheer absurdity of the situation, combined with Moore's commitment to staying in character, left the other driver stunned and speechless. This story, filled with humor, nostalgia, and the enduring charm of Clayton Moore, became a holiday tradition for Thomas on Letterman's show, much to the delight of audiences. With the exception of one year, Thomas returned annually to recount the tale until Letterman's retirement in 2015, keeping the memory of Moore and his larger-than-life persona alive for a new generation of fans. Through moments like these, Moore's legacy as the Lone Ranger transcended the screen, solidifying his place not just in television history but in the hearts of those who admired him both on and off the screen. In 1979, Clayton Moore, who had become a beloved figure through his portrayal of the Lone Ranger, faced an unexpected legal battle that shocked his fans and the entertainment world. Jack Rather, a producer who had acquired the rights to the Lone Ranger character, obtained a court order that prohibited Moore from making any future public appearances as the masked hero. Rather's decision was motivated by the fact that he was in the process of producing a new Lone Ranger film and believed Moore's ongoing public appearances as the character would undermine the value of the intellectual property and potentially harm the movie's success. Rather also feared that rumors might spread suggesting that the then 65-year-old Moore would reprise his role in the upcoming film, which could confuse audiences or detract from the introduction of a new actor as the iconic hero. However, Rather's attempt to sideline Moore turned out to be a public relations disaster. Moore, who had become inseparable from the character in the public's eyes, did not take the court order quietly. He immediately filed a countersuit, asserting his right to continue embodying the character that had become synonymous with his own identity. Rather than abandoning his connection to the Lone Ranger, Moore cleverly modified his costume. Instead of the signature domino mask, he donned a pair of Foster Grant wraparound sunglasses, subtly keeping the spirit of the Lone Ranger alive while abiding by the court's order. This move also allowed Moore to participate in Foster Grant's popular ad campaign, Who's That Behind Those Foster Grants, which not only kept him in the spotlight but reinforced his association with masked heroism, even without the Lone Ranger mask. Public support for Moore was overwhelming. Fans saw the legal action as an affront to the actor who had spent years bringing their favorite character to life, and they rallied behind him. 
Rather's new Lone Ranger film, The Legend of the Lone Ranger, which was released in 1981, suffered greatly as a result of the public's loyalty to Moore. Not only was the movie panned by critics, but it also flopped at the box office, grossing only $12 million, an amount that fell drastically short of the film's $18 million production budget. The failure of the film further highlighted the strength of Moore's connection to the Lone Ranger character and the public's resistance to seeing anyone else in the role. The legal battle between Moore and Rather continued to drag on for several years, with both sides unwilling to back down. Moore's fight to retain his association with the Lone Ranger character reflected his deep personal attachment to the role. He was often quoted as saying that he had fallen in love with the Lone Ranger character and that he tried to live by the moral principles embodied in the Lone Ranger creed, a set of values that included justice, honesty, and loyalty. For Moore, the character was not just a role he played, it had become an integral part of his personal life and identity. This deep connection made Moore's battle with Rather more than just a legal dispute, it was a fight to preserve his legacy. In 1984, after years of legal wrangling, Rather unexpectedly dropped the lawsuit, allowing Moore to resume public appearances as the Lone Ranger. The reasons behind Rather's decision remain unclear, but two months after dropping the suit, Rather passed away from cancer. The timing of Rather's death and the resolution of the lawsuit seemed almost poetic, as Moore was finally free to reclaim the character that had defined his career and life for so many years. Moore's lifelong devotion to the Lone Ranger character made him a unique figure in Hollywood history. Like another famous cowboy star, William Boyd, who became inseparably linked with his role as Hopalong Cassidy, Moore transcended the typical actor-character relationship. He fully embraced the values of the Lone Ranger, not just in his professional life but also in his personal life. This deep identification with the character became evident when Moore received a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. Uniquely, his star bears the inscription Clayton Moore, the Lone Ranger, signifying the extent to which he and the character had merged into a single entity in the minds of the public. Moore's contributions to the world of film and television were also recognized in other ways. In 1982, he was inducted into the Stuntman's Hall of Fame, an acknowledgement of his physical prowess and dedication to the action-oriented aspects of his career. His influence on Western films and television continued to be honored in 1990 when he was inducted into the Western Performers Hall of Fame at the National Cowboy and Western Heritage Museum in Oklahoma City. Moore's star power extended beyond Hollywood, as he was also awarded a place on the Western Walk of Fame in Old Town Newhall, California, solidifying his status as one of the great icons of Western entertainment. On a personal level, Moore's life was marked by a series of relationships. His first marriage to Mary Moore in 1940 ended in divorce two years later. He later married Sally Allen, with whom he had a child, but that marriage also ended. Moore eventually found lasting happiness with his fourth wife, Clarita Petroni, whom he married in 1992. They remained together until Moore's death, and by all accounts, their relationship was filled with love and mutual respect. Moore's wife later shared deeply emotional memories of their final moments together, revealing how even as Moore faced the end of his life, he still longed to hold her hand, a testament to the strength of their bond. In his final days, Moore's health deteriorated due to heart failure. He died on December 28, 1999, in a hospital in West Hills, California, after suffering a heart attack at his home in Calabasas. His wife, Clarita, was by his side during these difficult days and described how heartbreaking it was to see him in such a fragile state. She reflected on their love and his lasting impact on her life, stating that his actions and devotion to her transcended ordinary expressions of love, reaching into the depths of her heart even in his final moments. Clayton Moore's death marked the end of an era, but his legacy lives on. He left behind not just a body of work but an enduring image of a hero who stood for justice, fairness, and unwavering moral principles. For fans of The Lone Ranger, Moore will always be the one true masked man, and his influence on the Western genre, as well as on American pop culture, remains profound. Even decades after his death, the image of Clayton Moore as The Lone Ranger continues to inspire audiences, reminding them of the power of integrity, perseverance, and the timeless appeal of a hero who fights for what is right.